Well, good morning, New Hope. Let's all stand and sing Spirit of the Living God. Scripture reading is Genesis 22, 1 through 8. Now it came to pass after these things that God had tested Abraham and said to Abraham, Abraham, and he said, Here I am. Then he said, Take now your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah, and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him, and his Isaac his son. He split wood for the burnt offering, and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. Then on the third day Abraham lifted his eyes, and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey, and the lad and I will go yonder and worship, and we will come back to you. So Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering, and laid it on Isaac, his son. And he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and the two of them went together. But Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, My father. And he said, Here I am, son. Then he said, Look, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. So the two of them went together. Well, this morning we have special music, and it's from Pat Harris. Her song for the month is It Is Well, and she asked me to read this to you guys. It says, life can be unpredictable and challenging at times, but our faith and trust in God will help us through life's hardships and trials. He gives us the assurance of his love and of our salvation. What is this assurance? It is a promise, a guarantee, security, and an insurance from our Heavenly Father, assurance that at the end of life's journey, we will spend eternity with Him. And her favorite song is, It Is Well. When peace like a river attends Yeah. 
day when my faith shall be sighed. The clouds be rolled back as a scroll. The trump shall resound and the Lord shall descend. Even so If it is well with your soul, say amen this morning. Let's all stand and sing, He Touched Me. Thank you for this day, Lord, we can come to your house. Lord, thank you for this day you blessed us with. And now we thank you, Lord, for this time we can come together and give back a portion which you blessed us with so much. Lord, thank you for your many blessings and thank you for your goodness and thank you for blessing this church. Lord, use these monies and use these offerings, Heavenly Father, to lead others to you that don't know you as Lord and Savior. Thank you for all you've done for us in Jesus' name. Amen.
Are your hearts quieted now? Are you tentative? Nothing like, nothing like beautiful music, is it? <clears throat> well, we're continuing with the journey of, uh, of Abraham. And uh, remember last week, Abraham had his heart broken a little bit. His son Ishmael was now about 13 or 14 years old. He wasn't a baby, he was a teenager. And because he, he was mocking his, his half-brother, which would have been Isaac and his mother, uh, not his mother, but Isaac's mother, uh, Sarah said, this just can't be. He can't have any part of Isaac's inheritance, and he must go. And God confirmed this. I think this is very important. I don't know if we stressed that last week or not, but God confirmed this to Abraham. Abraham didn't want this to happen, and, and Abraham does it basically said, does this have to happen, Lord? Because he loved his son. And God says, yes, it's necessary. And so he had the sad uh, job of sending Hagar and Ishmael out into the wilderness or out into the desert, gave them some bread, gave them some water. And when the bread and water ran out, uh, Hagar was sure that they were going to die. She set her son under a bush for some shade. She walked off a distance, and uh, she sat down and waiting for her son to die. She did not want to see him die and waiting for herself to die. But you know, when we're at our lowest point sometimes, this is when God comes forth and speaks to us. And so God sent an angel, remember? And uh, the angel spoke to her and said, uh, to fear not, uh, God heard the boy's cry and her cry, and uh, he said, uh, my promise is still stand still, still stands firm, uh, that, that your son Ishmael, because he is of the seed of Abraham, will produce a great nation. And that's basically the last that we'll hear about Ishmael, other than uh, in a future chapter, it'll talk about uh, his lineage and so on, but we don't really hear any more about Ishmael, but God has made it very clear that there's going to be in, enmity between Ishmael and between uh, Isaac and their seed. And we see that and we experience that today in the Middle East, what's going on with the Arab nations. And uh, that is not going to end. Um, as we mentioned, uh, uh, not only do they war and fight with one another, but together uh, they have one thing in common, and that is the hatred for Israel and to wipe Israel off the face of the earth. And that isn't going to happen either. They have tried and tried, and God has always intervened, and uh, this is not going to happen. But nevertheless, it's still there. And so, as we come to chapter 22, this is a chapter that probably is one of the high points in the Bible. We're walking on the mountain peaks in the book of Genesis. Chapter 22 is the account of Abraham offering of his son, his only son, and God commands him to offer Isaac on the altar and then restrained him at the last minute when he saw that Abraham was willing to get, uh, go through uh, with the sacrifice. A lot of questions as we read this portion of scripture that can go through our mind, and I hope that we'll cover each one of these questions. One of them, of course, is why would God do something like asking Abraham to sacrifice his son, in other words, to kill his son. This is not in keeping with everything else that we know about God, does it? When we talk about mercy and love. But I think that you'll see the reasoning here, and you'll see something very special take place in Abraham's life. Abraham has had a long journey. It's been about 50 years since he was called out of Ur of Chaldees. And um, even though and I, and I want to make the distinction between Abraham and perhaps others even in the church, not necessarily this church, but the church, the overall church, where people that go to church do all the things that Christians do, but there's a difference between them and Abraham who followed God, who had a measure of faith, who had a measure of trusted in God, but he still had a little bit of that old, as the New Testament calls it, the old man was still there and taking over. And so you'll see that 
Each time that Abraham faltered and did things on his own, God removed himself from him. And then when he decided to do it God's way, God appeared to him. And this is the seventh time that God, and last time that God will appear to Abraham. He saw that Abraham was willing to go through with it. And this chapter brings us to the seventh, as I said a minute ago, and the last appearance that God makes to Abraham. After this, there is nothing more that God could ask Abraham to do. This is the supreme test that he brought to Abraham. And if you were to designate the ten greatest chapters of the Bible, you would almost have to include Genesis chapter, two, chapter 22. One of the reasons for that is that this is the first time human sacrifice is even suggested in the Bible. It is, in, it is very plain, and the purpose of God is to make it very clear to man that human sacrifice is wrong. This incident reveals that it also reveals that God requires life to be given, a life to be given in order that he might save sinners. There is no one among the children of men worthy to take the that place, God's Son was the only one. It's interesting that Paul said, the Apostle Paul said, God spared not his own son, but you might add that he did spare the son of Abraham. He did not let him go through with the sacrifice of Isaac. This chapter compares with Psalm 22 in Isaiah 53. And the first time that perhaps you read these verses, and it probably isn't the first time, especially with Isaiah chapter 53, but it certainly is kind of breathtaking as you read something that takes place several hundred years before the event actually takes place. Isaiah, you're familiar with Isaiah, I'm sure, 53, so I will not read it, but it depicts exactly what's going to take the very letter of what is going, what's going to take place on the cross when Jesus was crucified. Right down to the point where his body being beaten, where his, his side will be thrust with a spear, and it says not a bone in his body will be broken. Now why is that significant, that last statement I just made? Because it was common uh, when a cru someone was crucified that towards the end of the day, the Roman soldiers would come and they would break the leg bones of the individual so that it would speed up, uh, it would speed up death. But when they came to do that to Jesus, Scripture was fulfilled and not a bone in his body was broken because he was already dead. This was all planned by God right down to the absolute second and it was prophesied. But what I'd like to do is I'd like to read a, a portion of Scripture that is not as familiar to probably most of you. And I'm reading from the Living New Testament, so I'm going to read a little bit different from what the version that you have. But it's Psalm chapter 22, and listen to what it says. I'm going to read the whole psalm. Uh, actually, I'm going to read the first eight verses. My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Why are you so far away when I groan for help? Every day I call to you, my God, but you do not answer. Every night I lift my voice, but I find no relief. Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. Our ancestors trusted in you, and you reached them, and you rescued them. They cried out to you and were saved. They trusted in you and were never disgraced. I am a worm, not a, uh, a man. I am scorned and despised by all. This is the description. I'll stop there for just a moment. This is the description of what Jesus looked like when he went to the cross. When a Roman soldier, when, 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 they, when, they, uh, uh, when Pilate said uh, and sent Jesus out to be scourged, a Roman soldier would stand on each side of the prisoner. The prisoner, in this case was Jesus, would stand face to the post, po post and he would be tied to the post. And each one of the leather, leather straps that was hitched to the, 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 uh, the whip had bones interwoven in it. And those big burly Roman soldiers would throw that whip out there and it would wrap around the body and they would pull back and it would rip the flesh out. 
Forty lashes save one. Why? Only 39? When the law said 40? Because they really believed that 40 lashes would kill a man, but they did not want to kill Jesus at that point. They wanted him alive. And so the description it says here in verse 6 of Psalm 22, I am a worm. He looked as a worm. He wasn't even distinguishable of what he should look like after they got done with him. And that's not a very comfortable thing to hear from time to time, but we do need to hear these things because he was willing to do that. He didn't have to do that. He did this willingly to take the punishment that belonged to us. It goes on to say in the seventh verse, everyone who sees me mocks me. They mocked him that day, remember? They put a purple robe upon him. They put a sign up over the cross that says, the king of the Jews. They mocked him. The eighth verse, they sneer and they shake their heads saying, is this the one who relies on the Lord? Then let the Lord save him. If the Lord loves him so much, let the Lord rescue him. And it's a pretty good description of what happened on that particular day when Jesus went to the cross. It's interesting that uh, the, uh, the Apostle James makes a, a statement concerning this incident, incident which may seem contradictory to other parts of the Bible. And we know that the Bible does not contradict itself. But sometimes we read something and they read something else and say, this seems contradictory. And I think this is important that we cover this. James said in uh, chapter 2, verse 21, Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Wait a minute. Justified means he was made acceptable to God by his works. Hmm. Doesn't that seem a little bit contrary to Ephesians 2, 8, 9? Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says we are saved by faith through God's grace not of works, lest anyone would boast. Seems contradictory. But now let's go to the Apostle Paul in chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. And he says, What shall we say then that Abraham our father as pertaining to the flesh has found? For if Abraham was justified by works, he hath wherefore to glory, but not before God. For what saith the Scripture? And this is it. Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Who was right? James or Paul? Is there a contradiction there? Seems to be. They were both right. They were both right. The answer is both of them. First of all, we need to note that both of them are talking about the same thing. They're talking about faith. Jesus is talking about the works of, James is talking about the works of faith not the works of the law. Paul is talking about justification before God, quoting the 15th chapter of Genesis, verse 6, way back when Abraham was just getting underway in his walk of faith. And at that time, only God knew his heart, and God saw that Abraham believed in him. Come back to a statement that I made a little bit earlier about there are people that perhaps in some of the churches that go to church and do all the things that the Christians do but they don't walk with God, they don't follow God, their heart really is not with God. Abraham was not a perfect man. He made a lot of mistakes. And yet it says here, God knew his heart, just as he knew David's heart. Even though David sinned and David failed, uh, David's heart was for God. This reminds us that when we fail and when we sin and we don't do the things that God wants us to do as far as walking the plan that he has for us, that he understands that. And he understands that if our heart is really to do right before him, he's always there to exercise his mercy and forgiveness for us. And he did this time and time again for Abraham. And it says in... Uh, the, in, in Genesis 15, 6, it said, Abraham believed in the Lord, and it counted him for righteousness. We can see that Abraham failed many times, and I am of the opinion that his neighbors might have said, we don't see that he is a righteous man. I wonder how many times our neighbors and people that see us say, I question whether he or she is really a righteous person. 
And the reason they can say that is because we're not perfect from time to time, are we? But when the day came that he took his son to be offered on the altar, even the hard-hearted Philistines had to admit that Abraham demonstrated his faith by his actions. James says that Abraham was justified by his works. When was he justified? It was when he offered Isaac up to sacrifice. But the question is going to rise, did Abraham really offer Isaac upon the altar? And of course, the answer is that he didn't. But he was willing to. That very act of being willing is the act that Jesus is talking about, that uh, James is talking about, which reveals that Abraham, in the works of faith, in his works of faith, James is emphasizing the works of faith seen in this 22nd chapter of Genesis. And Paul is talking about faith in his heart when Abraham had that Abraham had way back in the 15th chapter in verse 6 of Genesis. So this brings us to the, tw to the first verse, and let's take a look at that. It says, And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here I am. Now the word tempt here is a little bit strong. Probably a better word to use would be testing. God tested Abraham. James makes it very clear in the epistle that God never tempts anyone with evil. God tempts folks in the sense that he tests their faith. God did test Abraham, and he asked him to do something that seemed very, very strange, not only to him, perhaps to us also. The second verse says, And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son, Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee, in, get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will show thee. Now part of this test, there's more than one test here. Remember when God comes to him and asks him to take Isaac and to offer him as a burnt offering, he didn't say, I want you to go over here and do this. He says, I want you to go to a place that I'm going to tell you to go. You're not going to know about it until you get there. And also, it's going to take you three days to get there. You've got, you got to think a little bit. What do you think was going through his mind as he was walking those three days to take his son and to offer his son for sacrifice? I'm sure some things come to your mind. Was he questioning God? Why are you doing this, God? We would, wouldn't we? Right after this chapter, we're told that Sarah was 127 years old when she died. We see this in uh, chapter 23. We'll get to that, verse 1. And you put that down with this chapter, and you find that the boy Isaac was not just a, a, a little lad, like he calls him a lad here. Sarah was 90 years old when Isaac was born and 127 years old when she died. And that means that 37 years elapsed here, and since, he, and since he is called a lad in this chapter, we would not gather that he actually was in his 30s, probably somewhere around between 30 and 30 years old. Even this has significance. Jesus began his ministry on this earth around 30 years old. He died on the cross and rose again when he was around 33 years old. Can you see God's hand working in the Old Testament scriptures, preparing mankind for something that was going to happen in the future. He says, take now thy son. Notice how his, this plays upon the heartstrings of Abraham and of God. Uh, and he says, thine only son, Isaac, whom thou lovest. God is saying, Isaac, I want you to take your son, who I know that you love, and I want you to kill him. That's basically what was being said. Take now thy son, the Lord Jesus had taken the position of the son in the Trinity. Thy son, thine only son. The Lord Jesus is said to be the only begotten son. Thine only son, Isaac, whom thou lovest. The Lord Jesus said, the father loves me. And go into the land of Moriah. It is the belief of a great many that Moriah, 
that Moriah, that is the particular part of the Holy Lands, is the place where the temple was built centuries later and also the place that the Lord Jesus was sacrificed. <coughs> Golgotha and the temple area were not far apart. They belonged to the same ridge. A street has been cut through there and the ridge has been breached, but it is the same ridge and it is called Moriah even to this day. Let's not say that the Lord Jesus died in this exact spot. We don't know that. But certainly he died on the same ridge, the same mountain on which Abraham offered Isaac. And offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountain, mountains which I will tell thee. The burnt offering was an offering uh, up until the time of Mosaic law. Then there was a sin offering, and then there was a trespass offering given. Here the burnt offering speaks of the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it speaks about who he is. This is the offer of a human sacrifice, and frankly, it raises the small question, isn't human sacrifice wrong? And the answer is yes. It is morally wrong. Had you met Abraham on that day when he was on his way with Isaac, you might have asked him, where are you going? And Abraham, Abraham, and he would have replied, to offer Isaac as a sacrifice. And you would then, then have asked, don't you know that this is wrong? And Abraham would have said, yes, I have been taught that this is wrong. I know that the, the heathen nations around here offer human sacrifice. The Philistines offer it to Moloch but I have been taught otherwise. You would then question him further. Then why are you doing it? And he would explain, and this is the key, I know, all I know is that God has commanded me to do it. I don't understand it, but I've been, but I've been walking with him now for over 50 years. He has never failed me, nor has he asked me to do anything that he did not prove, that did not prove to be the best thing. I don't understand this, but I believe that if I go all the way with him, that God will raise Isaac from the dead. I believe that he will do that. And you will see that in, a, in another verse in just a moment, why we're saying that. Verse 3 says, And Abraham rose up early in the morning, and he saddled his donkey, and he took two of his young men with him, and Isaac his son, and he gave him wood for the burnt offering, and he rose up, and he went unto the place of which God had told him. Abraham takes Isaac with him, and he takes the wood for the burnt offering. What is going through Isaac's mind at this particular point? He's traveled three days with his dad. He's now asked to carry some wood uh, for the exact offering. Did he know what was going on? The answer to that, you'll see, is no. He did not know at this particular point of what was going on. Verse 4 says, Then on the third day Abraham lifted up his eyes, and he saw the place afar off that God had asked him to go to. It took Abraham three days to get there, but remember that it was on the third day that Abraham received Isaac alive. Back from the dead, as it were. That is why that Abraham looked at it. That is the way that Abraham looked at it. Isaac was raised up to him the third day. What a beautiful picture that is of what would happen later with Jesus. The fifth verse says, And Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye, ye here with the donkey, and, and, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. Abraham believed that no matter what happened up there in that sacrifice, even if God allowed him to take Isaac's life, that Isaac would return with him back down to be with those servants. Do you see that there in the scripture? The transaction that is taking place is between the father and the son, between Abraham and Isaac. And actually God shut man out at the cross. At the time of the darkness, at noon, man was shut out. The night had come when no man could work, and during those last three hours, 
That cross became an altar in which the Lamb of God, who taketh away the sin, was offered. The transaction was between the Father and the Son on that cross. Man was outside and was not participating in it. The picture is the same here. It is Abraham and Isaac alone. Remember that when Jesus said it is, it is finished, darkness came over the whole earth. There was an earthquake. It rained, it hailed. It even said in the town, the graves were opened up and the people came out of the graves and walked around town. Doesn't say any more than that, what happened to them afterwards. The veil in front of the temple, as we've mentioned before, was ripped from top to bottom, signifying this is the end of the age of the law, and this is the beginning of the age of grace, even though grace was always there. God has always been exercising his grace. It says in the sixth verse, And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac, his son, and he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and they went both of them together. Abraham took the wood and laid it upon Isaac, his son. Remember that Christ carried his own cross. The, hot, the fire here speaks of judgment, and the knife speaks of execution of judgment of the sacrifice. The seventh verse says, And Isaac spoke unto Abraham his father, and said, My father, and he said, Here I am, my son. And he said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Isaac did not know the whole time what was going to happen, and that he himself was a sacrifice. And Abraham said in the eighth verse, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went, both of them, together. It's significant here that you'll see in just a moment. It's prophetic here that it says, God will provide himself a lamb. You'll see that God did not, in this instance, provide a lamb. But he would later on provide a lamb, and Jesus Christ was the lamb of God. Verse 13 tells us, if we jump to verse 13, tells us that shortly after this, and that's at the last note that you'll see on the screen, verse 13 tells us that shortly after this, there was a ram that was caught in the thicket by his horns. And Abraham got that ram and offered it. Abraham says here that God will provide himself a lamb, but there was no lamb. It was a ram. And here is the distinction. The lamb was not provided until centuries later when John the Baptist marked him, marked him out and identified him, saying, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of man. John 1, 29. God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. It is, a very, it is very important to see that Abraham was speaking prophetically. Abraham is now ready to offer the boy on the altar, although he does not quite understand. And we're going to stop right there, but I want to say that at this point, you'll see next week that Abraham takes and he binds, ties the hands of Isaac, lays him down on the altar. At that point, Isaac understands something is happening, and he's the brunt of what's happening. He was 30 to 33 years old. He was not just a boy. Abraham was an old man. I'm sure that Isaac could have taken him out if he wanted to. But here again is the most beautiful picture that I want to leave you with. Jesus went to the cross willingly. He didn't have to. Isaac, at this point, when he realized what was going on, obeyed his father and willingly laid there, allowing himself to be sacrificed. Isn't that a beautiful picture? We'll see the rest of it next week. Heavenly Father, thank you for the vivid descriptions you give us of what's going to happen in the future in the Old Testament. And thank you that we can live today and see that those things were fulfilled right to the letter. 
How can one not believe that the, the Bible, the Scripture, is the Word of God and that it is true, that it is relevant to our, our lives today as it was of old? I pray, Lord, that if there's anyone here that has listened to the Word of God today through the podcast or here today that does not accept you as their Lord and Savior, that this will be the day that they make that decision by simply saying, Lord, I acknowledge that I'm a sinner. I pray that you would forgive me, that you would become my Lord and Savior, and I will do my best to live my life from this point on according to your will and to your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you stand with me as we sing our closing hymn, Softly and Tenderly. <clears throat> Father, thank you for that call that you have given to each one of us. I pray that we have answered that call, and those that have not answered that call will answer it, Lord. We're living in a world that has many problems, many distractions, taking away from you and from your word. We just pray, Lord, that you'd help us to be the witness that you want us to be, the shining light, the salt in a world that needs you more than it ever has in the past. We ask you, Lord, now to be with us as we depart from this sanctuary. Watch over us and keep us safe. Be with those that have not been able to be here today. And bring them back to us again to worship with you in the future. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs>